talk about to you about how things are made. A lot of them. So this big round circle, this really big one, is called a cell membrane. And then inside it is this nucleus, and inside of that is the DNA. Now, there's um, these things that are called ribosomes. And all of them, so this DNA does not want to get destroyed. So it makes um, a copy of itself to send to these things, the ribosomes. And they make protein to make um, a human being. Um, and here is what this one made. Brachiosaurus. Does anyone have any questions before I go to watch my show? <laughs> you guys have any questions for Owen or Penny? Hi guys, or Theo? Theo's not great at answering questions. <laughs> What are they, my little mini me's? <laughs> you guys are so cute. Okay, let's see. Big. We have any big Owen questions, Lishi? Uh, do you like reptile too? Reptiles too? Oh yeah. Do you yeah, guys are... yeah. Especially dinosaurs. What? Yeah, what? yeah. Especially dinosaurs. They're a lot cuter than Clint. <laughs> that is true. That is true. <laughs> Well, you guys are amazing. What show do you watch? Uh, well, and what I, do you think of Sun Bears? I love Sun Bears, and I watch Jurassic Park. And what's your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur is Sticky Moloch that a lot of you probably have never heard of. <laughs> what about yours, Penny? What's your favorite dinosaur? Um, Isn't it Triceratops? Yeah. yeah. What's the best snake? Ooh. Ooh this is Penny, really Penny chances. What's, what's the best snake, Penny? What's your favorite kind of snake? A python. Uh, that's a good one. What's your thought, Owen? That's a good choice. Um, King Cobra. Cool. <laughs> you guys are awesome. This guy says the Brachiosaurus is a sauropod from the late Jurassic. What other sauropods do you know from the? Um, I know. The show, show them the other sauropod that you got on there, and how you know which one's which. So this is a yeah, Platypus I know, and I know Potosaurus and Brontosaurus and stuff. So I know the difference because Brachiosaurus has a big old bump with its nostrils on that bump, and it's really heavy. The Platypus has a longer tail, longer neck, doesn't have the bump, and its nostril is where a normal person's nostril is. <laughs> Gendar says my favorite dinosaur is a packy rhinosaurus. Ooh, I like that. And Chandler, your cousin, is on here. He's saying hi, Owen. Say hi to Chandler. Hi! Hi! Do you like dogs or snakes better? Tough one. I both of them. <laughs> How about you, Penny Rose? Snakes. Ooh, snakes, but she loves her dog. She loves Theo tremendously. Tanner, our dolphins friend, said, is Owen the legendary dolphins fan? <gasps> oh, yes! You... Tell them about the dolphins. Well, they're my favorite puffo player. They've been at mine for two years, and I even have one of their hats. No, but how'd you get that hat? Oh, so my dad's favorite clan is... um. <laughs> A cheese fan, and one time the dolphins were playing, and if they won, the cheese would get a big break. And he said that if they won, he'd get me a dolphin's hat, and they won. <laughs> no big deal. Um, and somebody, let's see, Nevaeh Shepherd says, "Hey, Owen and Penny or Clint, do you guys have names that would be good for a ball python?" What would Wally. You, what would you name a ball python? Uh, uh, tell them. Tell them. Hmm. What would you name it? Kitty. Kitty? Cutie. Cutie. That's I'd a name thing. mine um probably horny head. Horny head, <laughs> Wally, or Cutie. Those are the those are three great names. <laughs> uh, good. 
goodness. Anymore? And they want names. Now they let's see Luke Hernandez says he needs names for a crested gecko. Oh, now we need a crested gecko name. Slimy. Slimy? <laughs> that'll that'll introduce some misconceptions to people. And um, sticky. Sticky? Ooh, that's a good one. I like sticky. Sticky short legs. Sticky short legs. <laughs> no, tiny legs, because they're so tiny. All in once named a, a rat, Happer Happer Giskin. <laughs> Best name ever. I think he, he named Big Daddy. Yeah, he named Big Daddy, our tortoise. Yeah, a huge one. <laughs> what else? He's, they're all saying that you're so smart, and <laughs> they, you're so cute, and... Is that true? Are you guys smart and cute? Okay, you guys are awesome. Bye. Bye. You guys got Theo? Yeah. Take good care of him. Love you. Bye. Let's see. Love you. Now there's just the, the not as cute taller version. <laughs> Doing it. Get the, oh, thank you, Benny. Can you close the door for us? Yeah, Mommy. Yeah, go ahead. Well, all right. Um, okay, so I had, let's see. Let's see what we had as our, our winning categories today. Thank you for the help with the poll, by the way. I've had so many things on my mind, and so many things I'm like, oh, I could talk about that, I could talk about that. So it seems like the top two, and it's like neck and neck between them, is that I should explain both sides of controversial topics, and they want to hear about my cool surprise. So I will tell you, I for sure, as long as you guys remind me, will tell you about my cool surprise, but I might save that one for closer to the end. and. When it comes to controversial topics, one thing, uh, well, you probably notice it at least when it comes to reptiles is, you know, I, I always tell you like the pros and the cons because otherwise you can't make an informed decision. And I actually feel like that about pretty much everything. And you'll see in the world, like people will just tell you one side of things and they make the other side just sound ridiculous. And, and the other side will do the exact same thing and they totally misrepresent each other and I don't think they understand each other. And so how can you make an informed decision about anything? So if you guys wanna ask me questions about things that are controversial, I'd be happy to do my best to tell you what I know about both sides. And, uh, but, but recognize not all of those are like my opinion about which one's actually best. You've just gotta know the facts and make a choice. So I'd be happy to do that today. If you guys have questions about controversial things, just be like, tell me both sides of, uh, why it's a good idea to sniff paint. And I'll be like, it's not, it's not, that's not a controversial topic. Alicia's like, why did you say that? I'm like, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> you already got a super chat. No big super chat. Um, Thank Victoria you. Victoria Usher, she said, those kids are mean, <laughs> smart. Um, somebody Here. said spider ball pythons. Lots of people actually, it looks like. Yeah, sure. Gotcha, Fox Felix, and Henry Foster, and a few others have said Spiderball. Spiderball by then. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about him for a second. We've actually made a couple of videos about it, and I feel like in those videos, I've laid out most of the like factual reasons. Um, so I'll say, uh, first of all, let, let's say reasons not to um, wobble. That, that's, other, than, other than reasons that just pertain to all, all pets, right? Because all pets are questionable you know they're all unnecessary and they're for all pets there's the possibility and in fact the probability that because we have pets some will suffer um snakes especially right there's a lot of just downsides to keeping snakes one thing is well i mean most snakes eat well in fact all snakes are carnivores which means I'm going to be feeding them a whole lot of stuff so if you keep a ball python you're sort of signing up for the fact that maybe hundreds of rodents are going to need to be born into, I don't know what kind of conditions, but not wild sort of conditions. And then they're going to uh, have to be killed somehow, which, you know, we do our best to make that as humane as possible, but death is not a pleasant experience, you generally speaking. And then fed to stuff, uh, you know, that's not good. The snakes just period, you know, uh, maybe we don't know how to keep them. We're taking them out of the wild. And so, you know, even captive bred ones, the originals had to come out of the wild. So there's some ecological impact. When you breed them, stuff goes wrong. Just breeding snakes generally, stuff can go wrong. And, and so, you know, that's, 
you, you've, you've always got the possibility that some of them are going to just suffer and die just because of genetic defects. Then, then you've got the possibility that we don't know how to take care of them. So a lot of them are just going to suffer and die in captivity, at least until we figure it out. And then even once you do figure it out, a lot of people are going to not take proper care of them and they're going to end up having a horrible life. And even if it looks like you're doing everything perfectly, how do you know they're not suffering? You don't. So there's a whole lot of downsides to just snakes, period. And then spider on top of that has the potential. Well, they've, they've all got wobble, right? And it may appear because, you know, it may, it may appear that they're all fine for the most part, except for, of course, there are some extremely bad cases. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're, you know, just sort of like is the case with all snakes, but it could be a special case too for spider. Maybe even though they, they seem to not show signs of stress, maybe they are stressed out. Maybe they are having a more miserable life than our other snakes, other ball pythons, other reptiles, other pets. And we don't know. We don't know because they're not giving us any way to know that. And and then, of course, there's the, the fact that some of them are real bad. Right. There's there's some some minority of them, uh, you know, have these clearly, you know, and observably just horrible cases, which it's very difficult to imagine that their quality of life is good. And and so. You know, the, the, the easiest way to avoid all of that is just not to breed them. And and, and all we lose out on is. That that variation in, in ball pythons, but there are lots of variants of ball pythons out there. And so pick a different one, it, you know, and that's, that's a totally reasonable, right? That that's a totally reasonable position to have on this, this matter on the other side, you know, they, um, they generally do actually spectacularly well in captivity. Uh, the, 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 the ones with a really bad wobble are extremely uncommon and, and so, you know, the, the ones that don't have a severe, severe wobble, they seem to do really well. Ball pythons, one of the leading probably killers of baby ball pythons is that they're poor feeders and they starve themselves to death. All indications are that that happens less often with spider ball pythons because they're just notoriously good eaters. You know, people just repeat like, a, you know, a report never had a bad, a bad eater. You know, and I've, I've talked to people that have bred, say, 5,000 spider ball pythons. Zero of them have had like a, a, a wobble that prevents them from eating or where they're biting themselves, stuff like that. So it's really, really uncommon. And they do better in captivity than do most of the reptiles we try to keep, at least as far as we can tell. Again, there's always that possibility that they're they're suffering and we can't tell, but they seem to do great. Like their probability of surviving and, and growing normally and, and just doing well in general, it you know, it's certainly better than most reptiles you could try to keep. It's it arguably potentially better than other ball pythons. And so if we're going to draw the line and say, there's got to be a ban on these, we might need to start talking about banning almost everything we're trying to keep because at least as far as the captive environment goes, they do better. And so it's tough. Uh, you know, just, just for me, you know, like I find, I don't really like the idea of bans on things. I like the idea of education on things that the people should know what they're getting themselves into. They should make an informed decision. They should do everything they can to make life as pleasant as they can for pets. But at the end of the day, you know, keeping pets, it, it, it's questionable. It's questionable. And um, whether or not this is more questionable than keeping other pets is really hard to say. Anyway, that's kind of both sides on that issue. Obviously that one's been on my mind a little bit, but again, there are great reasons to be on either side of that. And I, I think the main thing is just to be informed and not to assume the worst. Because kind of going back, going back to that other argument, you know, uh, the why not, you know, a lot of times you hear people saying things like, well, though they only they only want it because of money and stuff like that. Well, that's not true. But, you know, there was a time when spider ball pythons were worth a lot. Now they're worth roughly the same as a normal ball python. Uh, you know, you can you can really misrepresent people. I think I think there are a lot of people who just don't like the idea of banning you know maybe maybe really any sort of pet reptiles because it can be a slippery slope and you know we see time and again that you know you start you start with something obvious to ban and then you go a little less obvious a little less obvious a little less obvious and suddenly all your freedoms are gone um very good a lot of people were <coughs> just kind of seeing me agree but most people just had some more reptile questions okay let's do it um a super chat from paul charbit super chat I'm about to get a king's monitor. 
Oh, oh uh, Kimberly Rock Monitor? It's Q U I N C E. Oh, Quince Monitor. Cool. Sorry. No, you're Quince great. Quince Monitor or a Peach Throat, but I was wondering why didn't you include them in your top six monitors? Would you include them in a top ten list? Thank you. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they do just fine and dandy. You know, a, a lot of the monitors, there are a lot of monitors out there that are pretty darn good. Um, and, you know, and there, there are some that are even better than, the, than those on my, my list. That, that was six of the best, not like the best six. You know, some of them, some of them that are really good are Australian monitors that we don't really have outside of Australia, or at least they're extremely expensive outside of Australia. Um, peach soaps and quince monitors, you know, they can be really great. Um, probably a, a little bit, a little bit shyer maybe than some of the monitors on that list, but there, there are some like, like the Timor monitor, it's a lot like those monitors, but just smaller and, and you know, they're, they're good. They're good. You know, we, we definitely could do more monitor videos. It's actually surprised me that our monitor videos haven't been more popular. Like to me, monitors are arguably like the ultimate lizards. And so I think everybody must think the same thing. They do not, right? Geckos seem to be more popular than monitors, which I get that too, because geckos uh, are the most distantly related to the lizards. So of all the lizards, the geckos broke off the first. So they have been diversifying off into crazy lands just as long as all the rest of the lizards combined have been diversifying into crazy lands. So there's all sorts of rad geckos. Anyway. Uh, Carrie Halliburton had a good question. She said, could you share with us any studies on reptile intelligence or sentience that you know? Yeah, I should, I should do more of this. One of them, and this is just one that always stands out to me, and I've probably talked about it before, but it was about bearded dragons. And, and it was, I think, did I even just talk about this in a recent live stream? I can't remember. I've been doing so much online teaching lately that I'm like, I know I shared this with somebody recently, but I don't know if it was here. So it's a bodacious study. They trained bearded dragons to push down a little lever in order to get a treat. And, and what they found is if they didn't train them to do this, I did this on the live stream. Okay. If they, if they didn't train them to do this, they would never push down that lever. And they let some untrained bearded dragons watch the trained bearded dragons and they immediately could do it. And so bearded dragons, who are, they're interesting because they're not, they're not lizards that are necessarily enjoying social interaction with each other, but they, they, they have very clear visual communication with one another that allows them to kind of sort out their hierarchies and, and avoid conflicts, you know, all the head bobbing and the bearding and the waving and all the things they do. And they can learn all sorts of really novel behaviors just from observing other dragons, which that's kind of high level intelligence right there. That's octopus stuff. <laughs> So some super chats coming in. Super chats! Elijah Snyder. Super chats, super chats! <laughs> Elijah Snyder says, Nidovirus and pythons. Breeders say it's too expensive to test for. It's $25 to $70, and no one wants to discuss it for keepers. Few people test all pythons. It's, you know, things like that are, they're scary uh, a little bit. You know, I, in a lot of ways, like I'm very, very reluctant to, bring stuff that I didn't produce into my collection, uh, you know, especially if it's species where I have a lot of them. And if, if I do, you know, the, the, the cheap way is to just uh, quarantine them for a very long time. Keep them, keep them away from the rest of your collection. Cause some of these things could just spread through and wipe out everything. And, and so, you know, testing your entire collection could be expensive, but testing at least anything new you're bringing in very good idea. Um, Nathan C left a super chat and I like, this one because it makes me excited about the reptile room. It says, do you ever plan on showing examples of ideal setups for adult size reptiles since everyone shows smaller starter setups but never follow up adult size enclosures? Absolutely. That's actually a big part of why we did the reptile room is because we want to be able, like, you know, when I have enclosures at, at my house, they're very, very functional, but not necessarily like display enclosures that I want to show people that are like, this is the way, this is the ultimate way to do it. And I really want to do that. And, and so, unfortunately, uh, unexpectedly, the global economy ground to a halt right in the middle of this. And so we're kind of like on pause and just trying to survive with the reptile room at the moment. But, uh, and, and I'm also, I've, I've been having to get a, a number of publications out the door. As soon as those are done, uh, I, I, and, and we can go to the hardware store uh, in a safer way, because I, I could go there now, but I'm nervous. 
I'm going to start building a lot of awesome enclosures and just showing you guys. And, you know, I'm going to try to do them in a way. I mean, it's a reptile room. It's not a zoo. And, 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 and what I want to do is I want to build enclosures in a way that is achievable for regular people, you know, so that you can have inspiration about ways that you could do it in your own home. And so I, I intend to get there. We, we plan to make a lot of enclosure build videos. Of course, right now we're not really filming because we're not seeing each other. There's a lot of stuff on hall, uh, on that's halted at the moment. And, and I appreciate you guys supporting us and, and being here for and us. And speaking of the room, we want it to be like you're coming into Clint's reptile room, into yes. our personal space. That's right. Where you get to know Clint and get to know the animals and have this experience. Um, I'm moving, I moved closer because... I was, there was they couldn't hear you, hear which makes so perfect sense. Let us know if that's better. Thanks, um, Leash. That is, that is the vision of the reptile room. Is It's, you know, it's not a zoo at all. It's just sort of like my dream reptile room, and you're invited to come hang out with me. And that's, like, that's that's my paradise. Um, Keith Bean said, where can we find your publications and scientific research papers? I would love to read them. Uh, Google Scholar. Would be a good place to go. Um, I'll to, I'm going to tell them my crazy surprise that happened to me this week. Okay. Okay, so this this is my crazy surprise from this week. Um, I'm 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 working on a few papers right now. Uh, they're they're papers from my my dissertation, and I I needed some sources on something, and so I I started to uh, actually I should back up a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit about publishing papers. So, so when you when you publish a paper, usually you find a journal that interests you, and most of the time it plays out sort of like this, which is that you send in your paper to the journal, and they send it out to a number of editors or, or, or reviewers, rather, a number of reviewers. The editor will send it to a number of reviewers who are sort of experts in the field that your paper is is dealing with, and those reviewers usually get back to you with a number of suggestions for things that you could alter and change about the way that you explain things in your in your paper. And so you make some tweaks and then you send it back to them. And then they send it out to their reviewers again. And then maybe it comes back one more time. You know, sometimes there can be a lot of back and forth. Well, I, I sent in a paper last year and and sometimes you don't hear back for months. I, you know, I, I've had it before where it's like months and months and months and I haven't heard back yet. And and this paper was like that. This, this is a, a review paper about evolution education. In, in schools. So a review paper is sort of um, where, where you're kind of looking at all the research that's being done and kind of making a summary of where does the where does the field stand at this time. And and I submitted this paper and then I just I hadn't heard back. So I'm like, well, you know, eventually they'll get back with me. Well I was I was uh, this week searching for for a reference uh, on something I'd said in one of my papers and in my Google Scholar search was a title I really recognized. I'm like that it's a lot like my title. Did somebody scoop me? Well, it was my paper. It got published in December, and I didn't even know about it. So that was a really exciting surprise. I, I was, like, jumping up and down for joy because that was just really fun, and I didn't see it coming. And that's actually at least the second time I've run into a, a, a paper I wrote on Google Scholar that I didn't know was published yet. But the last time wasn't one I'd submitted. It was one I wrote, and then I, I sent it to to one of my colleagues who finished it up and submitted it. And I didn't even know he'd finished it up and submitted it. And bam, there it was. Um, some good, good questions days. coming in. That was exciting. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That was my exciting news. But uh, Derek Company 13 said, hi, I'm a new subscriber. Um, Ky Kyra Gaylord said, my blog Python has been living in a bio for three years now. And I would like to make... Uh, in a bio? That's in like bio. a bioactive probably? Probably, yeah. A Paldarium now. Have you ever considered oh. doing a top video for Paldarium animals? I have. In fact, you know, if you've noticed on our new set, I built a, a Paldarium back there. I will tell you. Now, mine is kind of small as far as surface area, and I'm, I'm actually planning some some really big Paldariums in the future. Again, when the reptile room is up and going a little better, but. Um, the, the, the hardest thing that I've found is just making sure it's an animal that couldn't accidentally end up drowning in the water portion. Uh, you know, and most snakes are pretty good swimmers. So snakes are usually pretty solid. Um, I'd worry about a ball python more than some. Uh, like colubrids, I wouldn't worry about too much. But just, you know, make sure that all the conditions are, are right for that snake 
I love polydariums because they're beautiful, but if you've noticed, there are no reptiles in my polydarium yet, and it's largely because I don't think it's really a great setup for a whole lot of different kinds of reptiles. A 13-year-old said, would you feature the Schneider skink on the Best Pet Reptiles series? Oh, I, I absolutely would. It's, um, on the Best Pet Reptiles series would sort of require them to be widely available captive bred. I'm, I'm kind of not in the business of encouraging tons of people to get wild-caught animals. Um, when, when we go back to those controversial topics, wild-caught animals are actually a, a, a place that's more of a sticking point for me than, than most things. As far as bands go, like I'm more worried about what are we going to do to wild populations than almost anything. Like I don't want to endanger a, a wild population of reptiles. And so I'm, I'm not pushing huge on their, on their keeping until they're captive bred, but they're rad skinks. And so, you know, I'm happy to make a video on them where I explain this is why I probably wouldn't get one just yet. And and when they make it on a top five list, it's usually, and I think you should totally get one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nathan C, the one who we're just talking about adult enclosures. Oh yeah. He left two new super chats. Thanks, to Nathan. Teach. Whoa. Um, the first one said, "Thanks for the previous answer. Adult enclosures need um and should be featured more so that new hobbyists can understand the future needs and keep from getting in over their heads." And then he said, "FYI, I also thoroughly enjoy your is this the best pet of child videos." Well, thank you very much. And that's actually why we try to feature adult animals in our videos whenever possible. Like, I've had access to baby Brazilian rainbow boas forever. The challenge has been finding a healthy adult. I, I haven't been able to get one yet, uh, you know. And and because I want to show you, like, this is what it is for real. You know, if I show you a video with a baby retic in it, you'll just be like, well, that is a beautiful and affordable snake. But if I show you an adult retic, you might be like, mm, maybe that's not for me. And, and, and. And, uh, you know, I'd love to show you guys more enclosures. It's something people ask about a lot. The thing is, I don't, uh, in, in most instances, I don't personally have access to their enclosures. I don't have access to an ideal enclosure for them. And, and I'm a little nervous, too, about, you know, like, I'm happy to show you an idea for an enclosure build. I kind of don't want to show you, like, this is what the enclosure is supposed to be. Because I could show you a really over-the-top enclosure. And a lot of people who could provide them a very, very good enclosure, but not not that expensive, for example, would be like, okay, well, I can't, I can't possibly do this. And then if I show them, like, if I show you the minimum required, then all of a sudden people will be like, okay, well, that's the maximum. So if I'm anywhere close to that, that's good enough. And so it's hard to find that proper balance. Yeah. Um, let's see. Der Drop Company 13 left a couple super chats. One of them said, can you bring out a snake? And he has a ball python. I I should bring out a snake. I, I had my kids and the dog and all that stuff at the beginning. I'm I a lot of my best handling snakes are at the reptile room and for you know holding them for a whole hour here. But if you don't mind me recycling some of the snakes that I've already used, I would feel a lot better about making them sit here the whole time. Um, Tanner, our dolphins friend, said thoughts on the drafts last on the draft last night. Oh snap! Somehow I lost track of the draft. I've been hearing all this stuff. There has never been a more anticipated NFL draft ever, and I've been thinking so much about this live stream and the papers I'm writing that I I spaced it. So I'll have to check that out. Uh, how the dolphins do? Um. So some more super chats. I'm going to read just a couple more, and then Thank we're going to hop over to Patreon. For oh a my second. goodness. Um, Justin Packer, I'm going to read this because that has some all caps in it, so I'm going to read how it's written. Okay. Clint, you guys are stinking rad. Why don't you teach the herpetology class at UVU? That would be amazing! Also, I got my first ball python eggs this year. Woo! Uh, teaching the, the herpetology class would be excellent, but uh, Josh and Joey, I think, are the ones currently teaching it. And, you know, like Joey Muggleston is somebody I've known for years and years and years, we were in graduate school together forever, and uh, he. So, I, I, I mean, I'll tell you flat out, like he he knows more about reptiles than I do, uh, and and uh, you know, I can't I can't really imagine somebody better to teach you. He actually, as a graduate student, taught my entomology class because the something happened with the entomology instructor. And, and so I've, I've taken a full course from him you and it was great. Together and yeah. Oh yeah. That, that's when we became like such great friends. He, he actually owns and runs Great Basin Serpentarium. So you hear me talking about, about Great Basin Serpentarium. He, he owns it and runs it and he does such a great job. And, and he has, 
I have a number of animals. He's probably got, I don't know, 30 times as many animals as I do. So, At least. so when it comes to showing you stinking rad stuff in class, uh, he's your guy. He's your guy. Um, Northwest Fancy Fuzzies left a fifty dollars super chat. Holy cow! Thank you so much. Yes. That that really helps because like you probably understand, you know, like the reptile rooms closed. Everything's everything's very questionable for the future, and so thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um. So Northwest Northwest Fancy Fuzzies, they say hi, Clinton family. You are being trained in the reptile rescue, so all the herds are watching. Will you film the building of your custom enclosures, possibly with tutorials for us to follow along? Thanks for your enthusiasm during these times. Absolutely, positively. Exciting. I've got a lot to learn about how to film good videos like that, and I'm going to need my my team, who's currently all I'm hiding in their houses. Oh, I cannot I wait. This, so, so this summer, I'm going to have all my papers in, and I'm not going to have to be worrying about those so much. I'm not going to be teaching my classes. It's going to be all reptile room all the time and herping. Herping, reptile room, videos, you guys. It'll be the first time since we started this channel that I can actually devote like the majority of my working attention on you guys and, and my family. I'm so excited to see them. I love them so much. I almost started crying yesterday when I was thinking about all the fun things. I, okay, I did cry yesterday because I was – I was thinking about all the things I'm going to be able to do uh, with, with Owen and Penny, uh, like build, build car tracks and just the silly stuff that I love to do, but I just haven't had time to do in a long time. I am so excited. So excited. Um, Drop Company said, it's okay if you recycle your snakes. Um, to hold, to hold the, like, recycle through the... Oh, okay. I'm like, <laughs> are you tell you, you're suggesting I get a King Cobra? Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, let's pop over to Patreon. For Patreon. Some good. So, so Aqua, Aqua, you probably know this name. Aqua Remax Pets. Oh, yeah. Aqua, uh, Aqua Remax? Yeah. Uh, Russ Wilson there. Yeah. Said, Clint, I wish I could attend the live streams, but my work schedule rarely permits me to do so. I enjoy watching afterwards, though. My question is, what are your preferred methods for preventing and treating pets that can affect reptile and or enclosures? Um, like mites, grain mites, fungus, gnats, photo flies, etc. Oh, so the scariest of all of those, and I'll just maybe talk about those right now, are, are mites. And the biggest thing is to be very, very careful about what you're bringing in to your collection. But, you know, you can end up with them. You got it. As soon as you notice mites, you treat mites because they can spread everywhere really fast and just be really, really difficult to get rid of and deal with. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's the biggest thing is just try to be proactive and try to make sure you don't bring them in. And once you have them, treat them. You just you just deal with it. You know, it's going to be a nightmare. You deal with it. Um, Ryan Tanner, I like this question. It says, how do you choose reptiles for videos? Do you have a list that you go through? Do you have no clue until you reach out to your friends or pet shop? I have do both of those. Things. the scenes on Instagram. That, on Instagram that is a Instagram. fun idea. So... A lot. Of, I have I have a number of things I do. Sometimes there's an animal I really want to uh, cover, and it, fortunately I have I have some good connections, like with Great Basin Serpentarium, uh, with with Animal Ark in Orem, Utah. Though those are two places. Uh, uh, Don's Garters has was awesome for our garter snake videos, and and he told me he told me a while back because I used to talk to Don all the time about garter snakes because I love garter snakes and they're so underrated, and you know, he used to tell me how people would look at his garters and, and ooh and ah and then just walk away and not interested. And now because of you guys, like the demand far exceeds what he can produce. And, you know, and like I, I got goosebumps all over when he was telling me about that. And, and, and so I've also got just a wonderful local uh, reptile community, the, the Wasatch Reptile and Invertebrate Keeper Society, Rick's. Um, they're wonderful. And I, I reach out to them sometimes on social media, uh, as well as my, my friends and other connections. Sometimes I go to animal arc in Orem and I basically go shopping for animals to steal. And then, you know, and then I, I, I coordinate, I go home and I write and I hope they don't sell before the time comes to, to film a video on them. Um, you know, at first it was, it was mostly my own collection. Suggestions help a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I pay so much attention, especially if there's an animal 
people keep talking about over and over and over again. There's one that we're featuring tomorrow that people have been requesting all the time lately. And Are you going to give them a hint? Nope. No, I'm not. But it's been highly requested of late. <laughs> um, let's see here. Make sure we get some that aren't Patreon and Super Chats, too. Yeah, I am. I'm, okay, yeah. Got- You're doing a good job. Sorry. Elizabeth McGovern um, says, from Nolan, age nine, I have corn snakes, and I'm on the waiting list for a bull snake from Snake Discovery. Oh. And mean, are there any supplies you would recommend for their care that might be different from my corn snakes besides a bigger home? Yes, my mom keeps snakes, too, so I will help have help with my kids. Corn snakes and, and gophers and, and bull snakes are actually pretty similar in a lot of their care requirements. And I all I want to tell you is I'm so excited for you because – uh, Emily's tremendous and, and her bull snakes are awesome. And I grew up with bull snakes in, in Colorado and they're one of my favorite snakes in the world. Captive bred Emily bull snake. Amazing. Um, they're saying I need to be louder. Oh, so I'm gonna louder. Try and be louder. Louder, Alicia. Uh, Kyra Gaylord sent a super chat. She said, we've considered not having kids. And if so, I would like to turn the back bedroom into a bioactive enclosure for a retic or a black and white tegu separated by a sliding glass door. Thoughts on this? I think a bioactive enclosure would actually be really helpful even for children. <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's 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 gross to think about, but man, it would make things easier. You know, if it was fairly safe, you know, you wouldn't want to have a substrate that they could uh, consume, especially if it would cause impaction. Um, converting a room, things to consider, because I, I, I get it, that's very tempting, right? I think every reptile person is like, that is a neat idea. Um, do consider the effect that it might have on that room and the difficulty it might cause should you ever decide to move uh those are those are things to to keep in mind before essentially turning part of your house into an enclosure itself that said having a big bedroom like that and building a colossal awesome enclosure inside of it that'd be amazing and i and i also see the joy of building a walk-in enclosure in fact that's something i intend to do at the reptile room I want to answer this question from WDR Ross. Okay. He said, Clint, lace monitor video, lace monitor opinions. Wait, I'm answering this. I'm answering this. We (laughs) we went to the Australian (laughs) reptile park. Yes, we did. And there were lace monitors there. And Clint made us stay at the lace monitor (laughs) enclosure for way longer than I wanted to. And he just kept saying, leash. Look at those! Those are lace monitors! Can you believe it? We're standing right next to lace monitors! (laughs) What she said. So, I want to get those videos out soon, too, by the way. Yeah, we'll have have some some videos from our our experiences in Australia as soon as I get done with my writing here. Um, Let's see. Super Chat from Jared Langford says, I just bought a um, Maruki Maruki Blue Tongue Skin, and it needs a name. Do you have suggestions? I love peaches. Yeah. Kevin named, named his spud. So so we named th- this is here, I'll tell you a story. Okay, which which a quick story. A quick story. So you know my Maruki Blue Tongue Peaches. Um Peaches is great. And, and Joey from Great Basin Serpentarium forever wanted to breed her, as it turns out. She is a her. I didn't know. Um and so I actually ended up trading Joey for a northern blue tongue. Northerns are a little bit better suited to our climate here. And and so I, I have a – because they're, they're, they're a little more dry tolerant. And so so I have uh, now a northern blue tongue. And, and Peaches, named for the peachy coloration, is expecting her first litter of I babies know any this. minute. I find out the same time as everyone else. Yes, I should have told you long ago. You tell me about Peaches. I kind of want a rabbit? baby. I kind of we want have a baby. to have a peaches baby. They're expensive. Well, it's our blue <laughs> tongue having the babies. We <laughs> might have to see. Joey, I've, I've, I've thrown out a lot of pitches for you today. Can you give us a deal on a baby from our northern, uh, from our Maruki blue tongue peaches? Well, we'll name it and cream. Um, okay, so SoCal Ryder says herping with family too, herping overall. Oh, yes, all of that. I'm going to – I. I'm going to be doing so much herping. We we had, if you noticed our Tinley video, we've got actually finally really good sound recording equipment for being in the field, which means we can do some awesome herping and you'll be able to hear us. And, and we brought it with us on our trip 
uh, that we went on before and it got destroyed. And then, and then it got destroyed by an island that destroys all things. And then, and then uh, we took them with us to Nerd and they got left in an Uber, or not an Uber, rental. in a rental car. And so we lost our sound recording equipment again. And we have ordered it a third time <laughs> so we can do herping videos. Jason's probably really mad. Sorry, Jason probably sorry, Jason. just left the chat. Yeah, Jason, Jason has left the chat. <laughs> it's a sore spot. Sorry, Jason. Um, Alex C says, can you do a video on the golden lamps head? Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be, I don't know. If I can find one, I will. And Sam Smart says, hey, Clint, I'm getting a boa for a first snake. Any tips or suggestions? Thanks. Could you say hi to Toby, my brother? Hi, Toby. So, uh, yeah, I have suggestions. They're awesome. They are so awesome. But I will tell you, um, they, especially when they're young, they can be a little bitier than, like, your average ball python. And so um, while it's young, Learn how to read it and get it used to handling and, and just be okay with the possibility that you might get bitten a few times. It's not going to be a big deal while it's a baby. It's more startling than anything, and that's what I don't like about it. Um, this is a good question from Sean Bagels. Blue tongues have a little special spot in my heart because I was when we were dating, I think. Mm, talk loud. they got to hear this. When we, were, <laughs> when we were dating, Clint took me to one of his most favorite pet shops he, he would go to growing up in Colorado. And he wanted me to hold the blue tongue, but I was so scared because blue tongue skinks have those really big scales by their eyes, and it makes them look like they have these angry crow feet eyes or something. <laughs> so it freaked me out. I kept looking at its eyes, being scared. Mm -hmm. And after a long, long time, Clint was really patient with me. I finally held the blue tongue and just fell in love with it. And so blue tongues have a special little place in my heart because that was like one of the first I got to go see Clint's childhood pet shop that he went to growing up i got to hold the blue tongue and then i remember when we went and got our first blue tongue together which was peaches so this question when, when we can i can i add a yes. little bit more to that yeah when when we got married uh lisha lisha was in school and i was in graduate school masters and so we were living on like twelve thousand dollars a year <laughs> and so we were like um you know, we, we saw a blue tongue skink and it's like, hey, look, there's a someday way off in the distant dream lizard. Mm -hmm. But but it was a big part of Leisha's uh, conversion to reptile. She's a reptile convert. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this question, it's a good one. I like it. It says, are Northern and Maruki blue tongues personalities different? If so, what is your experience? Love from Philadelphia. That's from Sean Green. I, as far as personality goes, I find the Maruki and the Northern to, uh, of the ones that are commonly available in the United States, to be the two just greatest personalities ever. And they're great in really similar ways. I would say it would vary more between individuals than it would vary between species on those. They're both just lovely. I personally like the coloration a little bit better on the Northern and the body shape a little bit better on the Maruki. Um, I think if you live in a dry climate, a northern is probably a slightly better choice. And if it's a wet climate, probably a Maruki. They're both just amazing. So some good questions coming in real quick. Let's do a fast round. Rico Kellini, Kellino left a super chat. Hey, Clint. Uh, or hi, Clint. Just want to say thank you for your videos on jeweled poster goats and tokay geckos. They inspired me to get them. And I love them both, which is my best review ever. Oh, yeah. Also, would you ever do a video on golden skinks? Yes. Uh, if, if it has skink in its name, I would do a review on it. In fact, if it is a reptile and I have access to an awesome adult, I'll cover it, right? There's, I mean, obviously, if we've got a video on king cobras, um, I'm happy to cover everything. I, I, you know, The dream is to create a library resource for all of us that showcases everything you can get. It's just a matter of time. Um, Madison Page Sanford said, are there any reptiles you think should not be pets? And this is something I've been thinking about. Nope. Um, but, okay, this is nope with a but. There's a huge, huge number of reptiles that are not right for almost everybody. And, and there are some reptiles that either require a ton of care or we haven't quite figured out. So let me amend that. And also I should actually, so yes, I'm changing my whole answer. 
if it's if it's an an animal that isn't established as a captive bred population and is having trouble in the wild, absolutely not. I do I do not think we should have those at all, um, unless it is for the purpose of captive propagation for release into the wild to reinforce the 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 wild population. That's a whole other thing. But I, I think we need to be very very careful with our captive. With, with our with our wild population. When it comes to captive bred, I'm pretty much cool with everything so long as it's the right kind of person that gets it. And, and you know, I, I'm, I am naive in that I feel like people need education and then they will make wise choices. And I, I know I'm probably largely wrong about that and that, you know, maybe you need government institutions and stuff to prevent people from making stupid choices. But, it, it, you know, in my idealistic little little heart, I just feel like we just need to spread the knowledge and let people make good choices. And, and hopefully they do. Um, you're going to like this question. This is from Patreon, Kelly Howell, one of our patrons. said, since we're talking about, gen how, about how genetics are rad, how does paradoxing and ball pythons work on a genetic level? I know it's not something that can be bred for, but why does it happen? Yes! Was I right? Oh, <laughs> yes, you were right. You were totally right. Paradoxing. So it used to be that banana was the big mystery in, in ball pythons that I was, like, trying to get my brain around. And then I figured it out. And then I felt all better. And I have moved on to paradox as the thing that I really want to understand. And I could make a whole stinking video about just my thoughts on paradox. I think what is going on there, as I've, as I've observed them, it's really common in morphs that have dramatic color differences from, like, the wild type, such as banana and albino and stuff like that. The thing is... Um, like an albino snake shouldn't have any wild type alleles in it. It shouldn't have the alleles to make melanin anywhere, and it do. And and what I what I strongly suspect is going on there is that uh, you've got you've got two genomes. You've essentially got two siblings that have developed as one snake. This 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 happens. So I had I had a, essentially fraternal twins that where the two zygotes were very close to each other, and they just grew into one snake. And so uh, some regions are, this is called a chimera, and, and some regions have, one, uh, have the uh, genotype of one snake and some regions have the genotype of the other. And I suspect that this actually happens fairly often in a lot of morphs. Uh, it happens in people. People will have children and they'll get a, a paternity or a maternity test and it doesn't come back as their child. And it turns out that in their one body, they've got multiple genomes. And so it's effectively the child of their sibling, their twin, who happens to share portions of their body. I have never heard This of happens to people. And, and, I, and I suspect it happens to snakes a lot. It's just that the two siblings looked very similar. But when I get like a banana and a non-banana in the same body, it's really obvious that I've got two snakes going on here. And the thing, the thing that would make this very testable, and I'm giving this away, so just add me as a co-author. Okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna do this study, add me as a co-author. I'd be happy to run it over. But the in a lot of cases, if the if the parent was a male maker banana, which if you don't understand what I'm talking about, watch our banana video. If it's a male maker banana, then the the portions that are banana should be X Y. And the portions that are not banana should be XX, and that would be a really easy genetic test to do to test this hypothesis. I, I'd be very surprised to find out this isn't the case. Um, some good questions coming in along these lines. <laughs> Mark Fitzhenry said, "Could you talk about the science behind parthenogenesis?" Parthenogenic? Yeah. And Parthenogenesis. How does it yeah. And how does it happen? I would, I would love to, and I, you know, I, th I think there are a, a few different ways this can happen. Um, you know, one of the, one of the ways you can get parthenogenesis is just when they're basically cloning their own genome, and so you, all the offspring are clones. And, and then another way that it can happen is like what you see in Komodo dragons, for example, which is where the the females are actually the heterogametic sex, which means they produce. They're the ones that decide the sex of the babies, sort of like males and humans, where we're X Y, they're Z W, the females are, and they produce either. ZZ or WW 
offspring. So they're they're like they 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 split their genome in half and then essentially make like a copy of the whole thing. And so half of them turn out as males and the other half are not viable and die. And so some of the eggs don't hatch. The ones that do hatch out are males. And they're as inbred as you can be because they're homozygous for everything. But but they are males, which means if you're a lone female on an island, suddenly you've got a mate. And that mate probably doesn't have any really nasty recessive alleles anywhere because all of those eggs died. And, and so you've got this awesome male that you can totally mate with and inbreeding is not going to be a problem because he's as inbred as can be and he's alive. Um, Samantha Ectothermia said, Joey and Josh taught a great herpetology course, but I can't quite recall of any examples of herps with polyploidy. Polyploidy? Does this happen at all? Polyploidization. Uh, which is where you end up with an organism that has like double the size of a genome of another organism is fairly uncommon in animals. It's a lot more common in plants that can mate with themselves. The reason being, once your genome size is totally different, it's hard to find. Usually if you find a mate, they'll have a different number of chromosomes than you do. And so you'll end up with issues like you have with ligers and mules where the offspring are sterile or they don't work out at all. And so, so it's hard, you know, polyploidy can happen. It usually has a major effect on them. So they'd be very different just to start with because they got this huge genome. Happens all the time in plants. We watch it happen all the time in plants. Speci speciation happens like that in plants. There's evidence of this happening like, I can't remember. It's like three, three to seven times. I can't remember exactly the number. In the whole lineage of vertebrates where we had a, a whole genome duplication and then they were able to carry on. But whole genome duplications are a big deal because suddenly you've got a ton of genes that can mutate without losing the original function. And, and so you can have huge uh, radiations that can happen after a, an event like that. Awesome. Some super chats coming in. Super chat. Reptile says, hi, plant. Um, is a European lakeless lizard a good choice for a beginner reptile? If they were captive bred, they'd be great. I absolutely adore them. Um, Great pets, a lot like a blue tongue with no legs, uh, but they they are they are lacked grumpier. They'll hiss at you more, but, and apparently their bites horrific. But they they don't seem overly bitey, though they like food, so they could get you that way. Um, I I just wouldn't recommend them because it's not super sustainable. I, I kind of I think they're good for educational purposes right now, and for people who are genuinely trying to figure out how to breed them. Once we can breed those things, oh man, they're amazing. Um, Waver in Darkness said, everyone seems to think X, Y are the only chromosomes. Love to hear about the WX chromosomes. Good info and thanks. Oh, so X, Y, and ZW, they're the same thing. It's just that when it's X, Y, it means the male's the one with the two different. And when it's uh, ZW, it means it's the female that's different. So ZW, uh, birds are ZW. Um, a, lot of, a lot of lizards are ZW. Um, a lot of snakes are ZW, and then other snakes are XY, which is what made banana all make sense. Uh, um, and then a lot of them, uh, they so so, and that's just one pair of chromosomes. Like like you have twenty three pairs of chromosomes. Only one of them are the sex determining XY chromosomes. And and then a lot of animals don't have uh, sex determination by chromosomes. Like turtles and crocodilians and a lot of lizards, they're all temperature dependent. So. They, you know, when their their little zygote isn't male or female, it just depends on the temperature at which the egg incubates at very specific times, whether they'll develop into a male or a female. Um, Amy Lenoe says, I'm a secondary education and marine sciences student at UNE in Maine, and I'd love to read some of your papers. What journals are they published in? Can uh, I just search Clint Laidlaw? Yeah, just, just search for Clint Laidlaw or Clinton Laidlaw in Google Scholar, and you'll get a bunch of them. Is and there... She says, also, what do you think are the best bioactive plants for crested geckos last in Caledonia? Oh, well, the easiest one is pothos. And it's just great, and they like it, and it's very usable for them because it vines and all that stuff. It's really an easy plant to grow, but then it's also boring because everybody grows it. We actually are going to have a video on, on bioactive plants pretty soon. Um, Turbo Rooster says, do you think a yellow ackee for someone who has never had, do you think a yellow, a yellow ackee for someone who has never had reptiles before uh, is he probably seen is good? And what would be the approximate cost for a nice setup? Oh, um, I actually think, especially, especially for monitors, that's, ab that's absolutely the best 
monitor for beginners. And it's not a totally unreasonable beginner pet. It's just very expensive. It's an expensive pet for, you know, somebody who's like, ah, maybe I want a reptile. Um, the enclosure, you know, uh, a couple hundred dollars probably depends on if you take advantage of the dollar a gallon sale at Petco or where you get it. But, you know, I, I would say at least like a 75 gallon aquarium would be a, a great, a great size to go with. And the basking lamps need to be big and hot. Uh, make sure you've got a pretty good lid, um, and, and, you know, clamps or a sliding lid and, and substrate and stuff like that. But they're, they're not crazy. They're not crazy to set up. From Amar Suhail says, any idea how to help someone get over their phobia of snakes? My mother who lives with me is terrified of them, hence no ball python yet. Like, like in the room. So yeah, well, um, things, like, things like the reptile room, I have watched so many people change their perception of snakes because really a lot of it comes down, I mean, a lot of people have a very inaccurate understanding of what snakes are like. A lot of people think that all snakes are venomous and they think that snakes want to bite them. That is, that is a really common thing that people think. And, you know, it happens to not be true. But until somebody has their own experience with these animals, you know, they don't know that. They've got to they've gotta get a little bit close and push themselves just a little out of their, their comfort zone. I usually find you can bring them to a place like the reptile room. And you find somebody who's not going to try to force anything on them. It's just like, well, you know, hey, here you are and, you know, can you be within a few feet of it? And, and they'll watch you interact with it. They'll watch children interact with it for a while. And they're like, oh, maybe. And get a little closer. And then after a while, you're like, hey, I'll hold the headway over here. You know, would you be willing to, would you like to just touch the tail? And they're like, oh, well, okay, maybe I will. And then, and then you can be like, why don't you just hold the back of it? I'll keep her head over here. But, but you just hold the back of her. I love my boa for this because I can have the head seven feet away. And I'll be like, why don't you just hold just her tail? And it's like, they feel what it's like. And it's like, oh, my goodness. I never knew it would be like this. I never knew. And then all of a sudden they're holding a seven foot boa. Yeah. It's the just, yeah. And, and they, they will never be the same, but until somebody has an experience like that, it's, they're never going to change. Waver in darkness is the one that was talking about WX. Uh, oh yeah, Amazon, yeah. She said, right. Sorry. What I meant is that sex determination isn't as simple as people think it is. Oh, and I like that you're talking about different types. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hopefully we got into a number of them there. Yeah. Uh, Paul Dillon said, I need a better pet of black throat monitor or Asian water monitor slash Nile monitor or crocodilian. Okay. okay. Not, Nile monitor, crocodilian, black throat monitor, Asian water monitor. Right. There are a lot of localities of Asian water monitor that could make that the most re those are None of those are reasonable. Those are all unreasonable. Okay. So if you're like, uh, I kind of want something cool, none of those. Right. Those are all like I'm super into whatever that is. And so I'm going to get one. Um, all of those are doable, but they're all they're a huge, big deal. Um, you know, so so make sure that's really what you want. If you want just an, a, a big lizard that's quasi reasonable, tag you. Awesome. Let's jump back over to Patreon. Or, or Cayman lizard. There's a hybrid of everything you were talking about. Um, let's see. Randy Michael says. I have a very important and serious question. I have a Pac-Man frog, and his poops are epic in size. It keeps me up at night. His <laughs> digestive tract is like a TARDIS. Is that a oh, nerdy thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Doctor Who. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of environmental pressures would lead to this outcome? Oh, dude. So, so is the suggestion here that this Pac-Man frog deposits some massive poops? It looks like it, yeah. So this is this is probably kind of similar to uh, what's going on with blood pythons. Blood pythons poop rarely, but amazing. I feel like I just saw a video on Facebook of a Pac-Man frog pooping, and it was like the size of the Pac-Man. Yeah, frog, no. So maybe it's normal. The, well, the blood pythons the same way. Like uh, you know, my blood python's not a huge blood python, but it it drops an impressive human poop. You know, like it's I shouldn't really start measuring this out for you. <laughs> It's serious. It is substantial. It is, you know, it's, it's enormous, but they do it almost never. And both of those are ambush predators that are going to sit in one place for a long time. And it darn well better not smell like your poop or you're going to get found out by your prey and your predators. And so they're holding off on pooping for as long as they can. And then they just drop a colossal super poop and then they move away. 
and and hang out somewhere else for a few weeks. Tyler Lashbrook, another patron, said, what is your favorite photo locale that stays on the smaller side? Still looking for my first snake and would like to compare a smaller photo to something more popular in the hobby like the ball pit. Depends on what you mean by the smallish side. Um, but for me, it's the one that I just recently got, which is the Peruvian long-tailed boa, the uh, boa constrictor longicauda, which is just uh, Latin for long tail. Awesome. Uh, Julie Bajorling, another patron, said, do you know of safe herbs to treat parasites in the I don't. I'm not, I'm not. That's interesting. Though. Yeah, that's I'd a good like question. That's a good question. I'd, I'd like to know more about it. I, I usually just take him to the vet and get what I need. If... Your favorite friend from Ramen Reptile. Ah, oh, Ramen Reptiles! No big deal. You! I saw the lizard you made this last week on Instagram. Ridiculous. Somehow you're up in your game. Anyway. <laughs> right. Um. Can also, can we have a date night with you, Ramen Reptile, and you can, like, do a teach us? I would love to learn from you. I would love that. I would. Hey, but I've been doing art today. Uh, Owen, Owen and I, we were drawing uh, dinosaurs and whatnot. Just, just speed dinosaurs. There's my, there's my T-Rex for, for, for today. For our anniversary, we'll come to you and you can teach us how to sculpt uh, reptiles. Yeah. And your process and the, what you do. The, I would love that. Obviously, this is not referring to yours because they're uh, next level. But there's a great Far Side comic where. God is is uh, working with Clay, and he's like, man, these snakes are a cinch. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get on to her question. He says, what are your thoughts on the newest research that suggests infrared A produced by tungsten halogen bolts better simulates natural sunlight and may be better at providing penetrative naturalistic heat for reptiles? I haven't really seen it all myself, but... That would be spectacular news. I would love to hear that because, you know, mercury vapor, they, those bulbs are getting cheaper. They're, they're self-ballasted. You know, it's, uh, that's going to be great. You know, and if that's adequate for them, that would be just amazing. It'd be amazing. It'd be a lot easier to get people to do the UV because it's all built into their basking bulb. Hmm. Like the sound of that. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Um, Born to Eat Bacon, and our last Patreon question says, what are three adult reptiles, three adult reptiles that you would house a single a single specimens in at 12 by 12 by 18? Okay, 12 by 12 by 18? Correct. I'm not going to say, and I'm not going to say because it's already filmed. Is it? When we, is it coming out? Soon. We have a whole video for you. Oh, on geez. exactly, yeah, on exactly, well, I can't tell speaking. them. They got to watch the video, but I mean, we made a whole video about just that question. Um, a, lot, a lot of people are wanting you to talk about boom slangs. Boom slangs? Yeah, let's talk about boom slangs. They're just, all of them are like, talk about boom slangs? A bunch. <laughs> <laughs> like a video on boom slangs? I don't know. Okay, well, we should make a video on boom slangs. In the meantime, it's a bodacious colubrid snake that can make you all dead and stuff. It's uh, rear fanged and amazing. Apparently very, very uh, closely related to the mangrove snakes that we've covered on here. Neat. Um, Rocket Rumble just left the super chat. Dante Cefeli says, how do you feel about hybrids such as Burm Tangles Balls? Oh, I talked about my, my thoughts on hybrids on our Crestahua video. So so that's my more uh, detailed thoughts. Of course, you know, uh, uh, with controversial topics, I like to have a, a feel for both sides of it. You know, on the one side, it's, it's not out of nature, right? And it could muddy the gene pool. On the other side, it's not in nature now, is it? And, you know, as long as you're responsible about not just, you know, interbreeding it with your others and claiming that they're not hybrids anymore, uh, there's not too much downside directly. You know, it seems to be in a, a, a preference thing. You know, it's, it's sort of similar to morphs, but probably like one level beyond that as far as being controversial. Awesome. Um, Tanner, our dolphins friend, said, sorry for the delayed response. I was driving the fins got Tua, a tackle, and CD, so I'm pretty happy. Anyway, Whoa, they got Tua. I hope he stays healthy. A reptile question. 
What are your thoughts on agamas and which one is your favorite or which are your favorite? Okay, well, obviously bearded dragons are rad. And, and sometimes when people are talking about agamas, they're talking about like a gama gama. I love the giant clown agamas. I love them. And I would, I, I've actually never seen one in person. So I think I love them. Um, okay, good super chats coming in. I'm excited. Super chats, good super chats. Um, Col Colopsia said, what's your favorite isopod? My favorite isopod. I just got some of the little white ones. Those zebra ones are awesome. I love isopods. They're just all stinking rad. Land crustaceans are the best. Um, and reptiles. Oh, giant marine isopods. Scratch everything. That's my favorite. That's what I thought you were Yeah, say. I was all <laughs> thinking land like cleanup crews. Giant marine isopods. Um, reptile says, thank you, Clint, for your answer. P.S. I put some music on your rad freestyle rap from the last year. <laughs> Would you mind if I upload this video? No, not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Just tag us. I yeah, like yeah, I gotta it. see. Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, and then Amanda Cook from Ramen Reptiles left the super chat. Um, She says, LOL, I'd be way down for a sculpting date night, Clint. That would be so fun. <laughs> Quick question. As someone who wants a tegu but doesn't have the space, what are your thoughts on Ackies versus Lacerdas? They're both amazing. The Lacerda is both phylogenetically and behaviorally more like a tegu than is the Aki, but uh, they're both absolutely delightful. Interactive, intelligent, super bold, and little lizards. Um, they're not, I mean, they're a little bit shyer than a Tegu, but pretty darn bold for their size. Lars Hackerdus has been wondering this whole time if he can buy a Garfishi, can buy a Gargoyle Gecko in Melchon. Oh, I, I don't know. Um, it's gonna. It's it's probably just gonna depend on your laws. If if they're legal there, I almost guarantee to you people are breeding them. Northwest Fancy Fuzzy left a super chat and said, "Who is the herpetologist that documented the potency of the boom sling venom while he was dying?" I can't remember. Oh, I don't remember either. Oh, yeah, he was describing all of the uh, what was horrific. happening. Yeah, no. I don't like that. But that is that is a true scientist right there. They're like, okay, this is the horrific thing I'm experiencing right now. Um, dark fog video. Yeah, I'd like that. Scotland. Um, we have officially been live streaming for an hour and seven minutes. Oh, okay. How much longer should we go, guys? No. <laughs> don't ask them that. It's time. Well, I don't want it to get boring, but I'm having such a good time hanging out with everybody. Thank you, guys. I kind of needed this. This has been very uplifting. It's been a busy Carl and crazy Schmidt. week. Carl Schmidt. All right. That is a that five is hours. a real scientist. They want us to go five hours. Five hours, okay. An hour more. Ten hours. <laughs> hours. Oh, a super chat, real quick. I have a tegu, two savanna monitors, and a veiled chameleon, Chinese water dragon, Columbia boa, two bearded dragons, and camp pick between Asian water monitor and black throat monitor in a fourteen by ten foot by eight. That's all to look. Well, it, it pretty much as far as those go, I um, I would say. It depends on how you feel about giant water features. You know, this is going to be basically your Chinese water dragon enclosure on steroids. And so if you like that, you know, if you can deal with all the filtration and the pond and all that stuff, Asian water monitors are amazing. If you're happier to have more like a grassland sort of set up and, you know, more about just big spaces and not so much like a tropical, partially aquatic setup, then... Uh, black throat would be a good choice too. They're both on. They're both. Those are the two giant monitors from our top six or our six of the best pet monitors videos. So they're saying that they want you to go for two hours, three more days. <laughs> um, go until your eyes begin to fall. Um, when your eyes will start to fall first. <laughs> Leisha's such a good sport. She hasn't been feeling her best today, and she's been here Thanks, all this time. So I won't make her stay forever. But I'm having such a good time. We did get a couple more super chats really quick. Sneaking them in. Sneaking them in. Sneaking those super chats. Yes, Burns. This is really nice. Your enthusiasm is wonderful to see. As always, I'm so glad. I, oh, wonderful to see, as always. I'm so glad I finally caught one of these. Well, thank you. I think this has like been one of the most fun ones ever. So thank you guys so much for being here and making it special. Um, Transient Planet said, what are the best breeders or websites to buy Northern slash murky blue tongue schemes online? I'm a first time buyer and want to buy response. Great Basin Serpentarium. They're knocking it out of the park with blue tongues. Yeah. And, and they're not they're not inexpensive, Ro Ro but they're real good. It, by the way. Really good. Really yeah. good place to go. Tell them I sent you. 
Sorry, that was Transient Planet. Now we're on to what? They keep sneaking them in. Sneaker, keep sneaking them. That's Stop how we'll keep her here. Sneaking them in. <laughs> <laughs> we have to read the super chats. Rosa Destroya says, hey, just have my two Peters banded skinks. Love them to death. Kina and Butter are their names. Oh, I love that. Let me know if you have if you have hatchlings. Real, I mean, for real. Let me know. I would. I'm. I'm interested in that kind of thing. Ugh, these are really. Look great. at all those emojis. Oh, and they're gone. Yeah, because they're asking which is your favorite animal. Of, of those emojis? emojis. Oh, I don't even know. I'd have to have longer to stare at them. Yeah, I think it's time. It's time. All right, hey guys, thank you, thank you for being here today. It has been such a pleasure. I had a blast. We got to talk about such cool stuff. I love your questions. This has been so therapeutic and wonderful to be with you guys uh, every week during this time because it's such a crazy time. Wait, pause. Sam Bagel says, what is the special secret? I've been waiting the whole stream. Okay, so back to the special secret. The special secret was about that paper I did not know was published. It got published in December, and I just stumbled into it. So that was a big deal. In my life had me jumping up and down. It was just really exciting and, and cool. I'm excited. I like our I like our community. We built great it, people. You guys are seriously the best online community and and probably community period anywhere. You, you know, you just can't you can't expect people to be so great. And and we love you guys. You've you've done so much to change our our lives and our vision. For the future and, and and the things that we feel like we can we can do together with you guys so thank you so much for being here thanks have a good one and we hope to see you real soon